Okay, so week one of the Aussie Open is complete. Tonight we have quarterfinals action. Therefore, I wanted to weigh in on what we've seen from the tournament so far and make my picks and predictions for all of these upcoming quarterfinals. I would say it's been a pretty fun tournament thus far. Quite a few exciting matches all over the board in week one, as well as several big upsets. And I'll probably touch on all of these in talking about the eight quarter finalists road to this spot. So let's just start it off from the top. We have Gael Monfils, who has continued to mow down every opponent in his path, continued his excellent form from the beginning of the season as he is, I believe, the only player left in the draw yet to drop a set. He hasn't really been tested all that much, got through some, I guess, tricky opponents, you could say, in Bublik and Kekmanovic, who is a tough customer when he is on. I suppose you could also group Christian Green in there, although his play never really was up to par to that 16 seed. But regardless, Mofis has taken care of business, he's been efficient, he had a scare with the ankle injury rolled his ankle against Christian Green but I didn't see his match against Kekmanovic but he seems to have gotten over that and pretty much I'd say Mofis's track here has been routine he's done exactly what he needed to it's kind of nuts how much more efficiently he's been in both finals and just to the eye test the way he plays as he's gotten older into his career and I've got to say, after how tough it was last year, we remember him going out in the first round and being in tears in the press conference. He was in a really tough space at that point. It's awesome to see how it's gone completely 180 this year. Playing some of the best tennis of his life. It's great to see Lamont back in this spot. And for the second time in a Grand Slam quarterfinal, he is going to face Matteo Berrettini. These two faced off at the US Open quarters in 2019, played a very, very good match. Berrettini snuck it out in five sets. And I'd say his road here hasn't been nearly as routine. He looked rocky very early on in the tournament. He got Nakashima straight off the bat. Brandon really had a great shot to go up two sets to one on him. He had several chances to do so. But the ever clutch Berrettini pulled it out. And then I think a lot of people expected him to go out in the third round, myself included, when he faced off against Carlos Alcaraz. And I do want to talk about this match in particular. I wouldn't say it was particularly great quality, but it both encapsulated why everyone is so high on Carlos Alcaraz and why he's probably the best hope tennis has had for a teen champion since Rafa Nadal, I think. And then on the other hand, it showcased why Matteo Berrettini has become the big match player that he is. It showcased why he probably has the best intangibles of that around 25-ish age group that we used to call the next gen. And it was really those intangibles that carried him through here. Obviously, we know Berrettini's serve and forehand are dynamic, but he certainly does have his limitations as far as movement and the backhand wing are concerned. And early on in this match, it started very similar to Carlos's match against Tsitsipas at the Open last year, where he just came out firing. The adrenaline was rushing. He was... I think kind of just expecting to punch Berrettini in the mouth early, just like he did with Tsitsipas. But unlike Stefanos in that match, Matteo here, he really weathered the storm early. Mainly on the back of his serve, saving, I believe, five break points in his first two service games. And to that point, Alcaraz was kind of just in a zone where the ball bashing was going in every time. And after Berrettini saved those opening two service games, Alcaraz pretty much fell out of that zone, but he just kept going for everything the same way he'd begun the match, and they weren't really going in at nearly the same clip. And this continued for the duration of probably like a whole set, because it was like mid to early first set all the way up until mid second set. Obviously, Carlos got it together from down a break in that second set, but he'd already dug the hole and it was just a little bit too little too late. 
In the third, Berrettini did have some looks. I don't know if he had a break point, but he did have the Alcaraz serve under pressure early. He got through those difficult serve games and from mid third set, I believe from like three all, all the way through the rest of the match, young Carlitos really hit his stride. He found a much more balanced, controlled form of aggression rather than what he displayed earlier in the match. Berrettini kind of mailed in the fourth after he went down a break. And then the fifth, he matched Alcaraz playing quite well. Berrettini had his own injury scare actually early in that fifth set when he also rolled his ankle. But thankfully, all seems to be all right on that front. He played a very clean fifth set tiebreak of this match. I believe they were on serve all the way through until like 5-6 I want to say, I'm not totally sure. And from that point he was just steadier, Alcaraz leaked some errors there late. And that was pretty much all she wrote. I mean as I said, both players can walk away from this match with their heads held high. Berrettini obviously rebounded after that 5 setter to beat Pablo Carreno Busta impressively in the round of 16 in straight sets. Becoming the first guy born in the 90s, I believe, to have reached the quarters of all four majors. And ever since last year, I've continued to be really impressed by Berrettini. I've definitely underestimated him, and you've just got to admire the competitor that is Matteo Berrettini. Moving on, we've got Denis Shapovalov next. It's really been a tale of two halves as far as Shapo's road here. His opening two matches were very very scrappy made a match against Sun Wukwan that he ultimately could have very well lost much more competitive than it needed to be I didn't really catch his match against Riley Opelka but that certainly seems to have been the turning point as far as how sharp Dennis has looked so far I had said that before the tournament, I'd just close my eyes and pick him against Riley to make the fourth round. Historically, he hasn't fared great against big servers, and that's mainly similarly to Tsitsipas due to his inadequacies on return. But as far as what I've heard and as far as what I saw against Sasha in the next round, it does seem that Shapo did really commit to blocking back return, something that you need to be able to do against at least first serves of the caliber of Zverev and then of course any serve coming from Riley Opelka. And he seemed to get through against Opelka in relatively straightforward fashion, albeit four sets. And now we get to this quarterfinal. Now I'm going to say the Nadal fan in me was really, really cheering for Shapo to get through Opelka first of all. I truly felt that he had a much better shot at taking down Sasha Zverev than Riley did. Zverev historically just seems to have had the number of a lot of these big servers, so I definitely anticipated Shapo putting up the tougher fight if he was in form in a potential match against Sasha Zverev, but the story of that quarterfinal ultimately ended up being Sasha just throwing in one of those clunkers that we hadn't really seen since 2017 through 2019. I for one thought that was kind of a thing of the past given what we had seen for pretty much all of 2021. I don't really know what it was but he just threw in a complete dud here. You saw a lot of those issues he had in that span in slams where he was struggling so much from 2017 through 2019. You saw those same problems rear their ugly head back into this match. Just extremely tentative, especially off the forehand wing. Double faults at bad times. There were moments in this match and openings where he broke, like the second set he broke, took a lead was in a position to serve out the set where I was like, okay, even in spite of not playing his best, he's still going to end up getting this back on track. And it just never happened. And I mean, he was, he was very poor. Dennis, on the other hand, was fantastic. He did still end up having those spells where he was spraying airs for a bit, but he always wrote the ship. He'd already beaten Sasha multiple times in their head-to-head -head 
and just last year at ATP Cup, Chapo had pushed him to a final set breaker. It was a very high level match there, so I knew Dennis, if he was hot, could certainly pull off this upset, but I never would have expected it to go down the way it did. And ultimately, for the sake of an older Rafa Nadal, I am quite pleased considering how I don't love that Zverev matchup. But in the form and on the run that Dennis has been on, he is certainly going to be very tough to beat. Speaking of Rafa Nadal, he's up next. His play, I will say, has picked up considerably from when we last saw him playing competitively a week before the Aussie Open in Melbourne. He has shown up at the Australian Open a completely different player. The same things I was happy with as far as movement and serve in Melbourne have been equally strong if not better in the Aussie Open so far. Again there have been moments where the ground game has been a bit errant but that has also certainly one upped a level or two. His opening two matches, albeit both of those guys played pretty well, well above their average, didn't really pose much of a threat to Rafa. The match that stood out and really got me excited was the Karen Kachanov match in the third round. Kachanov has been able to push Nadal in the past, and honestly, if you ask me, I was more worried about that match than I was a potential Hercotch or Karatsev match in the fourth round. Still expected Rafa to win, of course, but I definitely didn't see it coming in the fashion that it happened. Yeah, it was four sets, but it was probably Nadal's cleanest match on a hard court in maybe two years. I mean, you could argue Aussie Open 2020, and uh, he was sensational in that match. A lot of vintage shots, a couple of excellent trademark passing shots. It didn't really carry into the early part of the fourth round against Manorino. He came out flat early in that match, but after a remarkable first set tiebreaker that had all of us Rafa fans on the edge of our seats, he ended up pulling away. What I do want to talk about with Nadal is the serve in particular. I did touch on it, but him going for more on both first and second serves has really gotten me excited here. I'm happy that he seems to have acknowledged that last year was a down serving year and he needed that to pick up again this year and so far it's been drastically better. Serve speeds are up across the board for him and that definitely bodes well as we head into the business end of the tournament. I'm not going to sit here and act like these thoughts haven't crossed my mind with no Djokovic, especially now with Zverev having been knocked out in the fourth round. Definitely can't get too far ahead of myself, but fair or not, for a 35-year-old who will turn 36 in January coming off a six-month break, this is probably Nadal's last great chance to capture that elusive and, in my opinion, long ago deserved second Australian Open. Of course, can't take anything for granted. It's been remarkable enough that he has come to the quarters, but he is playing well, and with how things have gone so far, I don't think anybody left in the draw is insurmountable for him, but I will get into more details on that when we get there, if we get there. But we can definitively say it's already been a very successful Australian Open for Rafa Nadal. But on to the bottom half, Yannick Sinner, I had him going to the semis here. He's been very workmanlike through his opening four matches. He split sets with Taro Daniel, but other than that, he's never really been threatened so far. He has just handled business. His most recent match on Rod Laver Arena against Alex Di Minore in the fourth round was probably the most impressive performance he's put in so far really just overwhelmed demon from the back of the court it's just been very impressive how sinner has just cruised his way into this quarterfinal i believe the second of his career now and he's looking great heading into a quarterfinal date with stefano Tsitsipas. as far as Tsitsipas's road here is concerned it has been much more scratchy he's had to work much harder to get here he dropped a set against Sebastian Baez as well as Benoit Paire 
and then survived a five setter in which he had to come back two sets to one down against Taylor Fritz. Now going into that match, I honestly thought Taylor was gonna win. I had RBA actually beating Taylor Fritz, but whoever won that match really, I was expecting to take down CC Poss. As always has been the case, CC Poss has fought tremendously to get here, obviously even without his best stuff. There was some uncertainty with his health coming into this tournament. I believe now he, as a product of his elbow injury, is now using different strings or a different stringing pattern. I'm not totally sure about the specifics on that, but it does seem that he's still kind of getting used to that. Even his tremendous forehand hasn't been quite as sharp as normal, but the serving for Steph has been terrific. It's been a big part along with how well he's fought of why he finds himself in the quarterfinals despite being a peg below his best. The CC Boss serve has certainly gotten much better over the past year and that's continued to be the case this year. I'm sure he can draw confidence from just winning these matches off his surgery and who knows an increase in his level might be right around the corner as a result. And on to the last quarter, Felix Auger Aliasim has found himself in the quarterfinals for the third time now in his last three majors. I've said this in the past about the last year for Felix, certainly I don't think he's even scratched the surface of how good he can be. But it's been baby steps over the last year, he's slowly but surely been turning the corner. Much like his countryman and good friend Shapovalov, he also started this tournament off very scratchy in the opening two rounds. Obviously was presented with a tricky first round against Emil Rusevori. Came through in five there, and ever since his second round, he's been a different player. He was posed with Dan Evans in the third round, who has been playing quite well this year. Ended up clobbering him. And then Marin Cilic, who has been playing better over the last couple of months than he has for the better part of the last three years. He was definitely dangerous, and after nearly going down two sets to love, Felix closed the last two sets very, very cleanly, was making minimal unforced errors, and was able to close that one quite impressively. He's continued the momentum that he carried over from last year into the beginning of this year. Strong showings at ATP Cup and now also in the Australian Open over the last two matches in particular. But he won't be thrilled to see Daniil Medvedev in the quarterfinals and I mean who would be. Could certainly make the case Medvedev is the best hardcourt player in the world right now. It hasn't been as razor sharp as it was early in the US Open, but Medvedev has also been tasked with a couple of different and probably more difficult opponents than he had in New York on his way to the quarterfinals. You know, as Kyrgios's ranking has nosedived over the last couple of years, it's become commonplace to see him playing one of these big names very early on in the tournament. And this year, that happened to be Daniil Medvedev here at the Aussie Open. And albeit in a losing effort there, we should take this time to say Nick Kyrgios again reminded us that he is box office. He played just about as well as he could against Daniil in the second round. Medvedev did an excellent job to stay focused throughout that match. Also served remarkably well. Um, I believe he had his career high in aces in a match. Was a lot of fun seeing Kyrgios here for two matches. Played much better than anything he had showed after Wimbledon last year. As I said before, he is box office, but we know what he is at this point. Who knows how much longer he's going to be playing still. With the state of his ranking, I wouldn't be surprised if he's not willing to put in the work to work his way back up. But in this case, he gave it his best and was just outclassed by the better player. Other than that, last night Medvedev had a bit of a tricky time with Maxime Cressy. If you didn't watch Melbourne the week before or the US Open first round when he defeated Pablo Carinabusta, Cressy has been a real throwback of a player. Bringing back the serve and volley, 
the guy does it pretty much every single point and I was interested to see how he would fare against Medvedev because net rushing has been a relatively successful strategy against Daniil. Nadal has taken advantage of it. Djokovic, uh, as of last year, started to take advantage of it a lot more in two of their three meetings at least. Even saw someone like Pospisil do well with it, beat Medvedev in 2020, I believe. And yeah, for the most part, after the first set, Cressy played him really tight, got him a bit rattled even, had a good opportunity to take the second set before Medvedev came up with a Houdini of a save down set point, and after dropping the third, was able to keep his marbles together enough to get over the finish line. Of course, Daniil Medvedev is still the favorite to win this tournament, and he's got a pretty favorable draw as well. I'm sure we're going to see him here at the business end of the tournament, and there's not much else to be said there. So on to my actual picks. With Mofis Berrettini, I got Berrettini in 5 along the lines of something like the US Open quarter in 2019. Really love how Mofis has been playing, I think he will give Berrettini a very tough fight and everything he can handle. I really do see this match as being able to go either way, but I'm just going to roll with Berrettini given he's the better big match player and that's been established already. Nadal Shapovalov, I'm going to go Rafa in a tight four. Certainly Dennis is going to be very difficult to beat if he continues playing as he has the last couple matches. He could very well beat Nadal, he was a point away from doing it on clay in Rome last year. He doesn't match up against Rafa nearly as bad as most one-handers or lefties do. Expect a difficult match here, but I just think Rafa will be too steady. Even when he's playing really well, Dennis is prone to at some point give some openings and Zverev didn't take those, I think Rafa will. Nadal in four there. With Sinner and Tsitsipas, I had Yannick going to the semis before the tournament. My feelings on that haven't changed. Tsitsipas hasn't been the most convincing. Sinner, on the other end, has looked to be in great form. Still think Steph is a bit undercooked, and I think that's going to make all the difference. I say Sinner in four. And then lastly, Daniil Medvedev against Felix Ojeda Aliasim. I'm glad of all my picks, I got this right at least. But, I mean, we saw it as early as ATP Cup this year, as well as the semis of the US Open last year. I don't think Felix has really cracked anything as far as the challenge that Medvedev has posed to him. He's taken one set against him, but that was before Medvedev had even had his great summer of 2019. Aside from that, Daniil has pretty much had Felix's number and their matches haven't been particularly close as of late and I expect the same thing to continue here. I think Medvedev, he's just going to be too solid and I still don't think Felix is patient enough to really, to really suffer and make this match scrappy. So I'm going to say Medvedev in straights here. And that'll do it for how I see these quarterfinal matchups shaping up. It's been a very eventful week of tennis at the Australian Open. These were my thoughts on much of what happened. Thank you all for watching. I hope that you enjoyed. If you did, it would be much appreciated if you could leave a like and subscribe to the channel if you're not already. Again, thank you all so much for watching. I appreciate it. And of course, I will see you all in the next one.